Good evening and welcome to Hello. the Castro Files. Good evening. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Doing well. Good. We got another cold night here in South Texas. Ooh, it's chewy. We're back to the to the winter time. We are. So it's all good though, but we got some stories to warm you guys up. You like what I did there? I do. Well played, sir. Well, <laughs> well played. played. Cool. Thank you guys for joining. We appreciate it, of course, as always. Um, first things, real quick, go out, check us out out on YouTube under the Castro Files. You can also check out The Bar is Open, where we post these stories once a week out on Sundays, generally at 8 p.m. So we've definitely got handful of other stories you can go back and listen to that are creepy yes. and fun and Good stories. weird and all the other things that go into it. So today I've got a couple of stories on caves where nice. this, how this popped into my mind. I'm not really sure, but I was trying to think of like natural creepy places right? <clears throat> that you could be in. Right. Um, first story talks about some people there. Have you ever heard of spelunking? I have. Okay. So this first story is kind of just the, spelunker kind of creep. I don't want to call it creepy, scary. It's more scary than anything. And then the next story I have after that is a haunted cave. So Ooh. what do you have to talk about tonight? I'm going to talk about Bloody Mary. Bloody Mary. Yes. The actual, like, when you stand in front of a mirror and you yes. say it. Which is one of those things we all grew up with. I didn't do it. No. I think I probably did, I did at some it. point. I was smarter than All that. All right. So like I said, go out, check <laughs> us out on YouTube and iTunes, Spotify, all the places you can, if you prefer to listen to audio versions, definitely go check out that. So with that, we'll jump right into the stories. You get with that? I am. All right. So as I said, the first ones, the first story I'm going to go over is spelunking and why some people decide later on in life, say you're 42 years old or something like that, you want to get into that as a hobby. That's something I could see really you doing. really sure. Nah. I could totally see you All saying, right. I want to so, try spelunking. I've got, I've got a, some pictures and stuff that I'll share with you, or a picture from this one that I'll share. But it goes to the point of, I'm not claustrophobic, but right. I'm respectful of small places you could get stuck <laughs> in. Right? I like that. That's you know, a good way so to put it. It's kind of like... I'm not really afraid of lightning, but I respect lightning. Right. right. So let me jump into my first story here. Six men adventure into a very dangerous cave. Only four come out. And this is was in Reader's Digest. And I'll post the, the story if you want to read it later on as well. With its narrow passages, flowing streams, and chambers studded with stalagmites and stalactites, Cascade is a caver's dream, but not for the novice spelunker. It can turn into a total nightmare. The rain comes down steady and hard. Jason's story hears it, but it's not is not worried as he prepares for the day of caving with five friends in his remote spot 80 miles northwest of his home in Duncan on Canada's Vancouver Island. He is dressed for wet weather and for just about any other predicament, a t-shirt, then two sweatshirts, a pair of overalls, neoprene socks, a water-resistant jacket, and rubber boots. Under his arm, he proudly carries his new helmet and headlamp. Sleep in, he whispers, bending down to kiss his wife, Caroline's story. Be careful, she says, always. It's 6 a.m. on December 5th, December 5th, 2015. A newcomer to the sport, Jason, has gone caving only four times. This will be his toughest outing yet, a cave called Cascade. It's dangerous enough that the entry is blocked by a locked metal door to keep the casual spelunker out. Hmm. The key can be, ta- can be obtained only after everyone in the caving party signs a waiver. About a mile long and 338 feet deep, Cascade is full of turns and barely passable tight squeezes, a claustrophobe's nightmare. Jason is the outlier among the group, with the least experience and at 43, older by a decade or more. A stocky father of two toddlers, he is a university drama graduate, Graduate turned entrepreneur, the owner of a window washing company. It was his friend Andrew Munoz, 33, who introduced him to the sport. Unlike Jason, Andrew is an expert caver, a former caving guide, actually, and a wiry paramedic who would know what to do if something went wrong. Jason, An- Jason Andrew, and two more friends, Adam Shepard, also a paramedic, and Zach Zakorski. Zoriski, rather, a chief and volunteer firefighter, drive through the heavy rain to the parking lot of the log cabin candy store in Port Alburnia, uh, Alberni, where they get the key to that metal door. There they meet up with Matt, Will, uh, Matt Watson, Watson and Arthur, Arthur Taylor, both pre- computer programmers. 
The six men drive up an unmarked trail for half a mile before parking in the clearing to take inventory. Ropes, harnesses, and carabiners? Check. Two bags that contain a small f- gas fuel jet boil stove, food, water, and first aid kit. And a mylar space blanket. You know those metal ones, the mm-hmm. real thin? Yeah. That resembles aluminum foil. Check, check, and check. They hike a bit more before coming to the door, which sits in the ground. If You'd miss it if you didn't know what you were looking for. Hmm. It's 10 a.m. They pull the door open and climb 30 feet down a rickety aluminum ladder. Go ahead and grab your chocolate, honey. Uh, into the black, each of them anchored with carabiners to a rope. The last one is in locks. Last one in locks the door behind them okay. and ties the key to the bottom of the ladder. It's a damp and chilly. It's damp and chilly and it's about 41 degrees. So it's already cold going mm-hmm. in there. With their way illuminated by headlamps, they walk down a narrow passage studded with jagged boulders. The silence is broken by a drip, drip, drip from above. Soon the drip turns into a light but steady flow. And they are wading in water up to their ankles, then to their shins. Everyone okay? Andrew, the de facto leader of the group, calls out. Yeah, comes the reply. Yep, me too. About 45 minutes in, Adam announces he can't go any further. His back, injured a few weeks earlier, is twinging. The constant hunching over has taken its toll. Matt escorts him to the entrance to let him out. He closes and locks it again and then rejoins his four waiting friends. For the next 90 minutes, they are explorers, taking their time as they crawl, stride, and slide through the caves to very different environments. Either pipe-like passages barely big enough to fit a grown man or chambers that are like the nave of a church, big but not overwhelming. Whether they go, they try, uh, wherever they go, they try to stay within 100 feet from the person who was who, to the last, congregating in the chambers between the more challenging crawls and climbs. Jason is in awe of his surroundings. Andrew once told him there are never, there are over a thousand caves and tunnels on Vancouver Island, and it's never the same. Cascade is like nothing he's seen before. Soon they approach one of the features that make the cave unique. A narrow passage, not big enough to stand up in, that leads to a short, tight downhill. This has a name. Bastard's Crawl. For for, uh, four streams meet here. And indeed, the water is flowing more qu- more quickly. Crab walk, Andrew qu- uh, it calls out. Once they emerge from Bastard's Crawl, they approach the top of the waterfall called Double Trouble. So named because a jutting rock splits the two streams. Okay. They set up their ropes to repel 50 feet. Boots and gloves, hands, hands claw for leverage on slippery ledges. The water gushes on either side of the rock formation. Landing at the bottom of it, bottom in a spray of bubbles there's a reason this cave is called cascade and as jason descends his heart is beating so hard it feels as if he's it was going to jump out of his chest you wanted a harder challenge he thinks you got it <laughs> a few minutes beyond double trouble they stop for a quick bite it's just before 1 p.m and they've been in the cave for three hours Andrew fires up the jet boil to make beef and chicken stew with rice. After their 20-minute lunch, the five head out again, sliding and crawling their way down towards the cave's end, less than a quarter a quarter mile away. But they get only 300 feet when Zach begins shivering violently. Although the temperature hasn't changed, the cold inside the cave can hit unexpectedly. The five decide to turn back. They start to retrace their route. They've been going for three hours already. Yep. Okay. They start to retrace their route. First Matt goes, then Arthur, then Zach, then Jason, then Zach and Andrew. The sound of rushing water grows louder. There's more mud than there was on the way up or the way down a few hours earlier, and it sticks heavily to their boots. Plus, they're now climbing up, so it's taking much longer to return than it did to come down. (laughs) Careful, one of the cavers up front yells to those behind. As it nears 215, the cavers approach double trouble. The sound of water has turned into a roar. What had been a gushing, what had been before been gushing, but manageable flow has now, is now a churning, angry white froth. How could this happen so quickly, Jason wonders? Is it runoff from the rain? Matt hooks the rope that was left attached to the top of Double Trouble to his harness and starts hauling himself up. The journey is not long, but maybe 50 feet. But it's tough, precise work, hoisting one leg to find a tiny, wet shelf in the rock, 
then a gloved hand, then the other leg. Once he has climbed to the top, he throws a rope down and Arthur follows suit. Then Jason, at the top, Jason crawl, gets on his stomach to pull himself up the incline of Bastard's Crawl. The water, deeper than before, smashes into his face as he powers through, the, through it. God, it's cold. Finally emerging through the opening and into the tight pa- next tight passage, he pauses, puzzled, but it splits in two. He can't see the two cavers ahead of him and is nervous about waiting at the top because there is really only room in this spot for one person at a time. I'll just go back and back down and ask, he decides. He carefully crab walks about 15 feet when the streaming water suddenly sweeps him on his back, submerging him. He feels the pressure of more water building up behind him. If he doesn't get out of the crawl fast, the merciless, merciless surge of water will pop him out like a champagne cork over double trouble and onto the rocks below. Mm. But he can't move. His boot's stuck between two rock shelves. Lying on his back with the water rushing over him, he tries to call for help, but instead he gasps frank- frantically for air. It has been about five minutes. He feels like for It feels like forever. Images of his family flash before him like a memento, fo- uh, mental photo album he tries to hold on. Caroline, whom has been he's been married to for 16 years and also warned him to be careful that morning. Jack five who loves airplanes and three year old Poppy, his princess. This is where he's located. So he is at the very bottom down here. Okay. You'll see it down at the very bottom of the um, cavern cavern, right? Zach, having followed Jason up, is now atop Double Trouble. He shouts down to Andrew, Jason's in trouble. Andrew clamors up behind Zach and goes to the bottom of the crawl. Heads up, Jace, he yells to his friend. He can barely see his friend's face through all the water. Jason is only a couple feet away, but he can't. But he's in such a precarious position and in such a tight space, Andrew can't easily pull him out. Keep on coming, dude. Toward me, head up. Jason is flailing. Place your feet against me. Lift your butt up and float. Come on, Jace. Jason's gloved hand emerged from the water, then his wet face. He's gulping air as if he has the hiccups. My leg's caught. Jason doesn't recognize his own voice because it becomes so slurred and slow as, he's, as if he's suffered a stroke. He tries to dislodge his boot, but it won't move. It's okay, dude. Andrew says, reaching into the rushing water and fishing around for the stuck boot. He grasps something solid. Is this it? Yeah. Well, we got ourselves jam. Okay, we'll do this together. 20 minutes after, you love the calm in his friend's voice, right? Just, hey, we got, got this. this. Yeah. Andrew's just, whew, like, you can feel it, right? 20 minutes after getting stuck, Jason emerges from Bastard's Crawl like a baby being birthed, wet through, eyes shut tight, and gasping. Andrew settles him on a narrow ledge inches above the water. Jason, uh, Jason, his eyes now wide open and looking bewildered, knows he has, uh, he had a close escape. You're okay, Andrew says, grasping his shoulders. Zach, stay with Jason while I, uh, while I get the supply bags up ahead. Takes him about 15 minutes to get his to get the gear. On his return, Andrew tells Zach that the water is still rising, so we should join Matt and Arthur just beyond Bastard's Crawl. I have to get Jason warmed up before we try to get out. He says, "If we don't catch up with you in 30 minutes, notify search and rescue." Unspoken is Andrew's fear that Jason is turning hyperthem- hy- hypothermic. So cold that he has stopped shivering. Andrew wraps his friend in a mylar blanket and fires up the jet boil. He warms Jason by pouring hot water down his clothes. Mm. As he does so, Jason's color starts to return to normal. Welcome back, buddy. Do you feel ready to get out of here? Within an hour hike to the entrance, they start to climb. Inundated by water, they're fighting it. Or it's fighting them, crushing them, pushing them back. When they finally near the top of the crawl, there are barely four inches of air left in the, uh, between the water and the ceiling. Not enough for them to keep their hands, their heads up to breathe. It's too high, Andrew calls. Turn back. Jason spots a ledge, although the wall is at an awkward 45 degree angle. There is room enough for the two of them. Andrew perches in front of Jason like a brunt of, uh, to take the brunt of the spray from the water. His legs uncomfortably bal- braced against the ledge on the other side of the wall. The water keeps rising, almost to the top of the ledge, and its sheer force and fury cause a wind to come up. Both, mo- both men know the caves have their own microclimates, and with nowhere to go, the wind whistles and, and keens. It's 6 p.m. They're about 200 feet underground at this point. 
Zach left them three hours ago. They huddled together under oh, a blanket. Wow. The jet boil is out of fuel. If we don't get out of here, our wives are kill are going to kill us, Jason <laughs> says dryly. Conserving the batteries and their headlamps, they, sl- they sit mostly in the dark, which makes them forget what a tight space they're in. Jason draws on his theatrical training, forcing his breathing to slow down and move through his diaphragm and up to the tip of his skull, trying to warm his face. He pulls his sweatshirt up over his nose. He thinks about his family and wonders how much life insurance coverage he has. (laughs) Andrew silently uh, recites the mantra based on a passage from his science fiction novel, his favorite science fiction novel, Dune. Fear is a mind killer. Fear is the little black death that brings total oblivion. It will let I will let the fear pass through me, and when the fear is gone, I will only remain. There's no sign of rescuers. Did the other three even make it out? Maybe they're lying on the other side of Bastard's Crawl, blocked by water and, or injured or dead. What the two men don't know is that their friends did make it out. They called for help at around 9 p.m. Members of the ground and cave search and rescue squads arrived on the scene and entered the cave, but the water level was too high, and they'll have to come back and try again later. The hours pass. Jason and Andrew don't dare move for fear of slipping. They doze off, then jerk aw- themselves awake, check in with each other every 20 minutes or so. You still with me, Andrew asks? Yep. You still good? Yep. Every once in a while, one of them turns his headlamp on to scan the water level. At around 5 a.m., it seems to be receding. Let's wait it for a bit and see. An hour later, the water level had gone down enough that they can keep their heads above water and try to escape. Stiff from sitting In one position for 12 hours, they slowly unfold their bodies. Jason screams in pain. A muscle in his groin is strained, but he's determined not to let it stop him. Getting out on all fours and through Bastard's Crawl, nothing else matters but that. Still, each time Jason moves a leg, he cries out, You can do this, Andrew exhorts. They are all there, and then they are through. After the next 90 minutes, they make their way towards the entrance at times in chest high water now in a passage that is high enough for them to walk upright. Jason sees some flicker in the distance. Lights! I see lights! Jason plows ahead. Soon their voices, soon they hear voices. Hey, they call out. We're here. Andrew? Jason? It's one of the rescuers. For the first time since entering the cave over 20 hours earlier, Jason's emotions get to him, and tears trickle down his his cheeks. We made it. His wife is still going to kill him. His wife's going to kill him. I like, would you go back to caving? I don't know. Yes and no. They did. You have to, otherwise you, <laughs> you let can't it let fear the fear you. ruin you, right? Yeah. I know. But so it wasn't still. a new hobby for them. They'd done this he before. He had only done it four times. Okay, so he had done it before. Then. Right. But His friend obviously was a was, lot more was experienced. He very experienced, Because he yeah. kept calm. No, Jason was experienced. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, Andrew. Andrew was very experienced, yeah. rather. Uh, he kept calm. Even like when things were dire, he was like, yeah. it's okay, buddy. Squeeze you your butt, this, you know, make yourself flow. Yeah. You, you got to, you got to rely on yourself. So yeah, it's just one of those things, man. And I, when I was reading the story first time going through, I'm like, please tell me to get out of this. Well, obviously, otherwise there wouldn't have been a story to tell. Well, cause there are a plenty of caving stories where there are accidents. People's yeah, right. headlamps die yeah. and all their batteries die. And there was even the case, um, where was it in Singapore or, um, Thailand or something like that with. The, all the kids got the stuck kids. in, the, ca- in yeah. the cave. That wasn't spelunking though. That was just walking. Well, they were down just into walking caves. down the cave. I know, but still, it's like it's scary, right? Yeah. You're underground. If you get rain and it's already raining, yeah. Like, come on, go during the. Is there a dry season in Vancouver? I don't, I don't know. know. But that's yeah. So that's funny. So we'll move from that to the cave ghosts of Hawking Hills. So this is where you know you start to think, okay, if something had happened, God forbid. Right. right, you know, so they didn't know the water was going to change, or did it only change because of the rain? Well, I don't think they anticipated the water levels okay. changing. That's what I'm saying. At, did they, especially they didn't, that dramatically. Yeah, right. It was pretty fast. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so over a couple hours starts filling up. Right, you know, and that can happen even in like tight places I'm like in northern Arizona. Oh, yep. Even in like northern Arizona, yes. right? You can be out hiking in you know little you know small canyon and something like that can happen you could be swimming in a perfectly nice swimming hole and that yeah. can happen right yeah. it just you don't know so all right so this next story the cave ghosts of hawking hills this comes from columbus underground not today not tomorrow but soon 
the leaves are going to change into a brief explosion of autumn hues. When they do, people from across Columbus will head south to one of the city's favorite play, uh, fall playgrounds, Hawking Hills State Park. Let's face it, the gorges, waterfalls, cliffs, and caves of the region are much more romantic setting for taking in the beauty of the season than city streets and subdivisions. Then there is one there then there is other great reason to visit the hills of southeastern Ohio this time of year, the ghost stories. Mm. As you leave the bustle of Columbus and venture south into the dense woodlands and shadowy hollows of the Appalachian foothills, not only do, does the topography get more interesting, but so do the myths and legends. It is as if a thousand years worth of collective men- memories have woven themselves into the landscape, landscape, invoking a sense of magic and wonder in all who visit. Well, almost all. When Dr. S.P. Hildreth was conducting the first geological survey of Ohio, in 1837, he came across a grim warning as he traversed a pastoral creekside 40, mi- 40 miles southeast of Columbus. There in his path stood the enormous beech tree with the message, this is the road to hell. Oh, geez. 1798. Go. We've got the little picture here to show you guys. There you go. That's the actual tree? That's the tree. Okay. It's still there. Interesting. Yeah. Undaunted, but perhaps a bit more cautious, Hildreth pressed onward toward, to discover a splendid wilderness filled with beautiful ravines, glistening waterfalls, and mysterious caves. Absent were the flame-licked souls of the damned and pitchforked-wielding devils foretold by the bark of the tree. Following the pleasant valley upstream, the surveyor had only traveled a couple of miles further when he came upon the most wondrous sight yet, an enormous horseshoe shaped recess cave filled with the ashes from hundreds of fires, Hmm. if not thousands of years of occupation by Ohio's first people. As Hildreth took to the, in the majesty of the location, he couldn't help but wonder if the cave had once been the, the fiery hell foretold by the beech tree. It was certainly a place of burning knowing that the natives knowing that natives during the time, during that time would occasionally discourage settlers by torturing and and in oh, extreme cases, lighting them on fire, Hildreth must, must have also wondered if the pioneer who scrawled those world words hadn't gone on to become one of the ash heaps he'd found scattered throughout the cave. Over time, the mystery of the message, along with the fate of its author, went on to become one of the many en- enigmas secreted away in the rock in the nooks and crannies of the region. The spot became known simply as Ash Cave. Because of its beauty, the cave became a popular spot for picnics and outings, and at one point a church took advantage of the natural amphitheater and held their meetings there. Unaware of the location was once likely very real hell on earth for at least one unfortunate settler. There are also, are so, sorry, there are also a tale of two pioneer children who fell to their deaths at the cave Yikes. while being pursued by Indians. While this isn't the, ha, while this incident had never become, <clears throat> never been confirmed, <laughs> some visitors claim the boys' screams can still be heard to this day. In the years since it became part of the Hawking Hills State Park, another legend has presented itself at Ash Cave, one that takes the form of a mysterious woman woman wearing 1920s era dress. Mm -hmm. Although her identity and reason for lingering are unknown, the spectral forms is said to follow groups in and out of the recesses, often coyly appearing from behind trailside trees before vanishing into thin air. Rocky House, the closest thing to a true cave in the Hawking Hills Park system also is said to be haunted by a lone lady. She's thought to be a woman named Mary, interestingly, (laughs) um, who purportedly was found dead at a resort hotel, which once stood where the current shelter house is located. According to legend, her body vanished before the police arrived to investigate and someone likely got away with murder. Anything but vengeful, Mary's spirit seems content to materialize just briefly enough to admire the wildflowers and wildflowers that grow around the parking lot. Old Man's Cave, the most popular destination in Hawking Hill, isn't without its hauntings either. Over the years, people camping in the vicinity have reported hearing an eerie baying of a hound that's thought to be trusted companion of the, of the cave's namesake, Richard Rowe. 
Roe was a trapper who lived along the banks of the Ohio River with his father and brother during the later part of the 18th century. When he was in his late 20s, the War of 1812 began, and the young man decided a reclusive and peaceful life was more his speed. So he packed up his things and headed for his favorite cave. From that point on, Roe spent nearly all of his life in the overhang, now known as Old Man's Cave, with only his dogs and a rifle to keep him company. In the 1850s, the old hermit accidentally shot himself <gasps> while using the musket's shoulder stock to breach through an iced over creek. He was like pounding down on it. And shot and himself. Shot, yeah. According to legend, other trappers found Roe's body and buried him uh, beside his beloved dog in the sandy floor of the cave the two had called home. For over for nearly 50 years followers, following this incident, people avoided the recess where this solitary fellow had lived, died, and been buried, be, uh, fittingly referring to it as the old man's cave. Eventually, though, word got out about the beauty of the gorge, and it became a must-go destination for Victorian picnics and days outings. One of the area's greatest entertainers in the early 1900s was a local man named James Isles. He would often serenade visitors with songs of whimsy and tell hair-raising stories of the cave's ghosts. In time, the spot garnered quite the reputation for being haunted. And as more and more tourists flocked to the ca cavernous valley, sighting of the old man and his hound became an almost daily occurrence. Hmm. There may be, um, strangely, the name given in the biography I'm sorry, I missed one. Following the sighting of a pair in March 1907, one local resident claimed to have returned to the Depression with a shovel and found it was indeed the final resting place of the man and oh, his geez. dog. They also reportedly found a short biography of the dead man's life near the grave site. Strangely, the name given in the biography was Retzler rather than Roe, and the dates cited were 50 years earlier than when the trapper uh, lived in the cave. Could there have been two old men in the cave? Maybe there were three. Maybe there were more later. Following the excavation of the old man's grave, sightings of the ghost reached their peak. The spirit was appearing with regularity that could only be achieved by a steady diet of pickles, <laughs> spice, and prune juice, a snack that was said to be a favorite of the specter. One sunny Sunday in August of 1907, the entity nearly made a nuisance of itself, stopping to observe four separate groups as they engaged in various forms of recreation around the cave. One woman even fainted at the sight of the specter and had to be revived with opiates. Oh, jeez. Her recovery was happy but sluggish. <laughs> in October of the same year, another group had an interesting encounter as they began to lay out their picnic in the cave when an old man with gray hair and a long white beard approached the party. They excitedly offered up their pickles and prune juice and mentally mapped out how they'd tell their friends about the time they picnicked with a ghost. When James Isles, the old man, everyone was seeing drift in and out about the cave in the 1900s. Oh, sorry. Everyone was seeing... Was Jim Isles, the old man, everyone was seeing drift about the cave in the early 1900s. He certainly enjoyed telling ghost stories about the place and reports seemed... Mm to drop off after he died at the age of 75. If so, perhaps he joined the other two whiskered wraiths who seemed content to spend eternity lingering in the ravine in the old man's cave. Nice. Cool That's little yeah. kind of story. I like you don't now. hear about these kinds of places unless you kind of just start researching, and just look mm -hmm. up some Looking interesting stuff. There's so much cool stuff out there yep. that you never know. Even just for lack, just to go, Check out something. some cool stuff. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if you're out there, go check out. Ohio, huh? Ohio, yeah. Ohio, all go right. Go do a little homework and Those were fun. Yeah. Those were good stories. So just remember, if you're ever stuck in a cave, you never know who might else be in there. Yep. Who else might be in there. Or who's been in there longer than you. Exactly. So. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm going to get uh, to my story. Again, right. it's from the Urban Legends, Ghost Stories, and Folklores. Very cool. Um, so it's going to start off with a brief what would bring Bloody Mary to people's attention? Every, I, I think maybe not everybody's heard of it, but a lot of people have heard of Bloody Mary. That yeah, the legend, that, like, the folklore, so, or I yeah. dare you to go into it's the It's almost like Candyman, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, there's an email someone receives. The subject says, Death by Bloody Mary. This email has been cursed. Once opened, you must send it. We've all gotten those emails before that's like, Got to see this to get good luck, right? Yep. But this one is this one is cursed. 
open once opened you must send it you are now cursed you must send this on or you will be killed tonight at 12 a.m by bloody mary this is no joke so don't think you can quickly get out of it and delete it now because bloody mary will come to you if you do not send this on she will slit your throat and your wrist and pull your eyeballs out with a fork (laughs) and then hang your dead corpse in your bedroom cupboard or under your bed What's your parents going to do when they find you dead? Won't be funny then, will it? Don't think this is a fake and it's all put on to scare you because you're wrong. So very, very wrong. Want to hear some of the sad, sad people who've lost their lives or have been seriously hurt by this email? Case one. Annalise, she got this email. Rubbish, she thought. She deleted it and now she's dead. (laughs) Case two. Jeez. Luis. She, she sent this to only four people, and when she woke up in the morning, her wrists had deep lacerations on each. Luckily, there was no pain, though she is scarred for life. Case three. Thomas. He sent this to five people. Big mistake. That night, Thomas was lying in his bed watching TV. The clock showed 12.01 a.m. The TV mysteriously flicked off, and Thomas's bed lamp flourished on and off several times. It went pitch black. Thomas looked at the left, and there she was, Bloody Mary, standing in white rags, Blood everywhere with a knife in her hand, then disappeared. The biggest fright of Thomas's life. Warning. Never look in a mirror and repeat the name Bloody Mary. And they do say it several times in the book. I'm not going to push it. <laughs> um, I killed your son. It's the end of the night. It's. It, I don't blame you, by the way. I, I killed your son. It is the end for you tonight. You are now cursed. We strongly advise you send this email on. It's seriously no joke. We don't want to see another life wasted. It's your choice. Want to die tonight? If you if you send this email to no people, you're going to die. One to five people, you're going to either get hurt or get the biggest fright of your life. Five to 15 people, you will bring your family bad luck and someone close to you will die. 15 to 25 or more, you are safe from Bloody Mary. This was a chain letter that was sent out over and over again in the infant stages of email, circa 1994. Uh. It could show up on your work email or at your... AOL account. There was really no telling when or where you would get it, but you were definitely going to get it one way or another. This was often many people's first interaction with Mary, but for the unfortunate, it wasn't the last. It was a hoax, of course, but why Bloody Mary? I mean, I've gotten those kind of emails somewhere oh, like, yeah. this change, good like, luck or, you know, you're whatever. You're going to make a million yes. dollars or you're going to be poor. Right. <laughs> so here's the legend of Bloody Mary. All right. uh, say her name three times in a di- dim lit room a mirror, and usually a number of giggling teens or preteens all gathered in so closely that even if she did appear, she wouldn't have any room in the mirror (laughs) as all the reflective real estate would have been taken up by pushing and pulling adolescents, exuberance, all trying to catch a glimpse. But what a glimpse of what? Uh, But a glimpse of what? A ghostly spectrum of their future? A demonic she-devil pretending their end? A phantom skull floating in either an auger or... uh, a phantom skull floating in the ether, an auger of things to come, a broken and bloodied reverent cradling a lost child, a jealous and hateful witch, a heartbroken and humiliated crash victim. Yes, could be all those things. The legend says that if you stare in a mirror in a dimly, writ, in a dimly lit room and call out the name of Bloody Mary three times, she will appear in the mirror. She may be benevolent or she may be break through the glass and eat your face. <laughs> And this isn't a Santa Claus type thing where if you're good, you get a good gift. And if you're bad, you get coal. It's a toss up. No one knows which mare you're going to get until it's too late. And let me tell you, more often than not, you're going to get the bad one. Why would anyone have summoned a Bloody Mary? Who is she? Where did she come from? And why a mirror? Let's start with the last first. Okay, this is a really hard word. And you and I were trying to say this earlier. It's catomatromancy, also known as inno. In, I don't know why these people make these words so hard. <laughs> Inoptromancy or captromancy is the art of divination through the use of a mirror. Yep. A Greek, you stare into the mirror. Right. And you get something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a Greek traveler and a chronicler born in 1110 AD and known to be the first to document the ruins of Troy says this of the origin- originations of this theory. Before the temples of Cressus at Patras, there's a fountain separate from a temple by a wall, and there was an oracle, very truthful, not for all events, but for the sick only. The sick person let down a mirror suspended by a thread till its base touched the surface of the water, having first prayed to the goddess and offered incense. 
Then looking into the mirror, he saw the presage of death or recovery, according to the face, appeared fresh and healthy or ghastly and, 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 and sickly. So this is said how they, the other. yeah. So you would send this down to the bottom and you would get a vision of what was going to happen to you. Okay. Here's where we can safely say the origin of at least the mirror aspect of Bloody Mary took root. Let's fast forward a number of centuries and see how this act uh, has evolved. Sometimes in the 16th century, this is very interesting, a form of this ritual was taught to young women as they were seeking guidance on marriage prospects. They were instructed to invoke the fates by walking up the stairs in a dim, dimly lit home holding a candle and a mirror. They would go they would do this backwards. As they ascended the steps slowly in the dark, they would focus all their attention and intention on the mirror. The flickering flame of the candle would cause shadows to dance across the walls in a manacle show of chaos and spontaneity. As they regarded the mirror with complete focus, they would catch a glimpse of their future husband's face. There was a possibility here, though, that they would anger the spirits and see instead of a flo- it would, and would see instead a floating disembodied skull. This was a portend to their death. It is often thought that this was the Green Reaper himself coming to mark the young woman as his. So we know where the, the, the mirror itself came into play. Where does Mary come in? Uh, so there were four different theories on Mary. Um, I selected two that I thought were the most fascinating. Cool. Um, so the first one is Mary Worth. Mary Worth lived on Old Wagon Road in Chicago, Illinois, in the middle of the 19th century. She lived in the forest in a small cottage and sold herb remedies and herb remedies dyes and potions she seemed kind enough and was often asked to speak with the dead or with animals when a crime was unsolved oh so therefore she was a witch she was old and seemed harmless enough although the town folks would avoid her for fear of being cursed and because anyone who would associate with her or use one of her potions would be shunned and accused of associating with the devil a short time after the civil war young girls began to go missing not only girls from town, but girls from across all Chicago. Over the course of weeks, with no end in sight for the disappearances, people began to get suspicious of Mary. It is reported that she began to be noticeably more agile and youthful. Even her gray hair and wrinkle, wrinkled face had begun to take on a more youthful appearance. Eventually, and with little else to go on, the town folks gathered enough courage to confront Mary. At first, they were deterred by the conviction in Mary's denial, but after a while, fed up and with no other leads, the town folks returned. What they found when they stormed her quiet cottage with the stuff of pure nightmares. Oh, no. The broken bodies of the missing girls were strewn about a large underground cellar directly under Mary's home. Not only that, but it was discovered that during the Civil War, Mary had been harboring runaways in her home, promising them safety only to slaughter them. Mary had tortured and killed hundreds in her rituals. Jeez. This was discovered that she was involved in the slave trade and had used that to fund her witchcraft. She's actually a serial killer. Yes. So disgusted and furious, uh, the town uh, were the town people were the people of the town. So instead of burying Mary uh, Mary in the cemetery, they dug a shallow grave near the cabin and tossed her corpse onto it along with broken mirror that they had found in the cellar. The mirror was to remind Mary for all eternity of the atrocities that she had committed while here on earth. The grave was topped with a large stone and Mary was forgotten. A little more than a hundred years later, the forest was, uh, was torn down along with the remains of the dilapidated little cabin and a subdivision was built. The construction crew gathered stones from the evacuation and used them in paving sidewalks for the homes. One home is said to have experienced nothing but bad luck since the time it was built. Cracks in the foundation... Dishes would explicably crush the floor. It was burned to the ground twice. Jeez. The house was never rebuilt after the second fire. It is said that the stone of Mary's grave from all those years ago was one of the stones used in the pathway of the house and that Mary was the reason for all the misfortune there. So that is the first. What year was Mary again? Was this back in like the 1700s? Mm-mm. Because it's interesting that... Remember, they were trying to have her help find different things, and then they turned on her. Well, yeah, so... But rightly so, right? So she was a witch. Some people would go to her for remedies, dyes, and potions. Yeah. Uh, then in the Civil War is when the girls began to go missing. Okay. So. Yeah. So that is one. In the whole polter... That's like the poltergeist. Yes, kind of exactly. Thing. Like... Yes. Yeah, you, you don't build a subdivision... Over a graveyard. Over a graveyard, yeah, exactly. Right? Uh, so the next... Um, 
theory is called The Miller's Daughter. Okay. Excuse me. This is a story told of a miller and his wife who lost their daughter to a witch in the woods. The miller's wife had recently purchased a salve from the witch for a very bad toothache. The miller did not have enough money to pay for the salve outright, but was assured by the witch that she would collect at a later time. He was told to go home to his wife and daughter and to give his wife the salve. That night, the miller was awakened by a horrible scream. He ran to the front door to see his wife running out into the fields. A little further on was his daughter floating out towards the woods. The miller grabbed his pistol and ran after his wife and daughter. They screamed for her to stop, to come back, but she was entranced. She could not hear them. She was being pulled to the forest by an unseen force. The millers noticed an eerie, unnatural blue light coming from the tree line, more specifically from a large dead oak tree. He saw that standing beside the oak tree was the witch from the woods. She was grinning wildly, hands outstretched towards his daughter. The miller fired all six rounds at the witch and then continued running. He caught up with his wife and they soon made it to the tree line. But by the time the witch and their daughter were gone, or by that time the witch and the daughter were gone, he immediately ran to the large oak and found five marks made by the rounds he had fired. He did not see the sixth round, but found blood on the ground next to the tree. They roused the village and made their way to the witch's cabin. There was no trace of the witch, but the miller found his daughter lying dead at the threshold of the witch's home, a single bullet wound in her chest. Lying atop the miller's daughter was a mirror, and written on it in blood was the word murderer. The miller stared into the mirror, tears in his eyes, accusation written in blood, and saw the countenance of the witch staring back at him. The witch's name was Mary Worth. Years later, the miller found Mary. He had never given up searching for her and had, in fact, dedicated his life to finding and killing her. He got his chance one faithful night as he stalked her into a new dwelling. So many times before he had been so close, but she had always invaded him. She'd always been just one step ahead. But this time, instead lead, instead of lead bullets, he had silver. And instead of a revolver, he carried a uh, Henry re- repeater, which is a huge, uh, like a, a rifle. Winch- it's the version yep. of, early mm-hmm. version of the Winchester. Uh, The miller caught her in the hip with his first shot and she ran as she ran. She fell to the ground, screaming and cursing with zero hesitance and zero remorse. The miller plunged a stake deep into her chest. She withered and thrashed as he dragged her back to her home. He doused her in the home in gasoline and lit her on fire. She screamed as she burned, cursing him in the village that they were in. Her last curse, and maybe her most unrelenting, was that if anyone would ever summer her by calling her name and staring into a mirror, she would, she would be loose again and exact her revenge. After the witch had died, the townsfolk came to see that what they could discover. The miller told them his story and was not surprised to hear that many of them had similar ones. They began to search the property and before long found a path in the woods that led to an alcove deep in the forest. There they found rows and rows of unmarked graves. Each grave held the body of a missing girl. So she, the, his daughter wasn't her it's first similar, and or only. Yeah, like again, another serial killer of kind of situation. Young girls. And he almost sounds like Van Helsing. Yes, <laughs> to yeah. me, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so that's that's where the 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 one the of a few of, yeah. stories and theories come from. Who Bloody Mary? But was. either way, the lore of it is still dates yeah. back. Well, a and long I time. didn't say I sent them to you, but after the fact, I, there's some pictures that we can put out there um, of some photos yeah, of what they think Castro uh, Files page. Of what they think she might look like. Right, awesome. Yeah, um, and that's what I had for you tonight. That's very good. So that is one of those ones. Yeah, like. We've all, again, we've all, I don't remember how old I was, probably like 12-ish yeah. or something I know that like I've that. heard of it. I just, and I think my friends did it, but I was too chicken. So yeah. I was like, I'll just sit on the couch right here and wait we, for you guys. I'm certain we did it when we were kids. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I think there might have been even a game when you but, were a kid that you played outside. Um, I don't remember that, but I definitely remember like going it's definitely, it's always, go, you always go into the bathroom. Right. Right. When you're going to say Bloody Mary, it, say it three times. I won't say it for you. Thank you. Right. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, absolutely. It's like, I remember doing that as a little kid. So I don't know. Very interesting story. It's kind of when you, when you said you were going to tell that, I was like, I haven't thought about that in yeah. years, you know? So right up our alley. So yeah, it was fun. Awesome. I liked it. Nice it was a good story. Read. It was honey. interesting. Yeah. So a lot of history in it too, which is kind of cool. It's kind of cool. Yeah. A lot of that stuff dates back to the 1700 or like, Early the email 18, 19, a little different, yeah. like we had said. Well, the email, I think, was 
is one of those things. Like we still get not as much, but I remember even like the chain things. Ten years ago, you would get those emails that was like, "You send this to two people, you win ten dollars. You send this to ten people, you win a hundred dollars. You send this to twenty five people, you You win blessed with thousand (laughs) dollars." Yeah. (laughs) It's awesome. Well, great story, honey. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, guys. That's it for tonight. Go ahead and, like I said, go out and check out the Castro Files out on YouTube. Give us a subscribe if you don't mind. And a go thumbs out up. To, and a thumbs up. And out on iTunes and Spotify. You can definitely rate and review the show out there. Yes. Please give us a five star out yeah. there. Yeah. Under the in, When we post it out, it goes out under the bar is open. Right. With Beth and Greg. That's where we post the audio shows as well. So yes. Thank you. Thank you, guys. So and uh, we won't talk to you before Thanksgiving, so I hope everyone has a very happy and full Absolutely. Thanksgiving with friends and family. Likewise. So cheers. Have cheers. a great night, everybody. Bye. Yeah.